Hi, Robert. Welcome everyone. We're gonna start at three, but we just wanted to give everybody the opportunity to make sure that your computer, you know, you can that you got into the Zoom platform and that you're feeling comfortable, that you're all set up and ready to hear this amazing presentation. So just uh, hold tight. We're gonna start at three, okay?
Okay, I see three o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and start. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. Laura Caramonica, and I am on the Education Committee for the Association for Leadership Science and Nursing. And this afternoon, I am joined by Dr. Cheryl Smith-Miller uh, from the University of North Carolina, and she is also a member of the Planning Committee for Education, and she will monitor our chat. What I'd like you to do today is to put your questions as we go along um, and put them into the chat uh, box and Dr. Miller will um, actually uh, monitor the chat and bring your questions forward at the end of this presentation. So let me begin uh, by just saying that ALSN is an international association. Uh, it's dedicated to uniting academic and service partners to shape leadership science and education in nursing. Today, I have the distinguished honor of presenting to you uh, three senior principles of you, you, you Learn Leadership, and, um, and they will talk today about their new theory, Human-Centered Leadership in Healthcare. Um, I present to you Dr. Kay Kennedy. She is an experienced chief nurse executive with additional expertise in healthcare quality and safety. Dr. Kennedy is a clinical instructor at the, the, the Yale, uh, excuse me, the Emory University, and she uh, is also a consultant, and she consults in the area of leadership, education, and team and individual coaching. Joining her is Dr. Lucy LeClaire, who is a highly motivated professional nursing practice expert whose work is grounded in research and evidence-based practice. Uh, Dr. LeClaire also teaches in Georgia at the uh, Kennesaw State University. She teaches professionalism and ethics in nursing, leadership in nursing, and healthcare policy for a culturally diverse world. Joining her is Dr. Susan Campus. She is a passionate coach and mentor with years of experience in nursing leadership, uh, particularly in the areas of critical care and burn services. Uh, she is also a content expert for Vizient in the Southern States Educational Platform. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the podium over to my colleague. Thank you. Welcome everyone. My name is Kay Kennedy and I just want to welcome you and thank you for joining us today. I also want to thank ALSN for giving us this opportunity to share our absolute passion, which is human-centered leadership in healthcare, an evolution of a revolution. Next. First off, we want to say that there's no conflict of interest for anyone with the ability to control content for this activity. Next. 
And uh, I think Laura covered this, but just mute your microphones unless you're asking a question and please make good use of the chat. Next. The objectives that we want to cover today are first of all, to describe the relationship of complexity science to the contemporary theory of human-centered leadership in healthcare. We want to identify for you the three dimensions of the human-centered leader and the impact that each one has on culture. And lastly, we want to explain how the human-centered leadership theory can be used in academia to meet requirements associated with domain number 10 in the essentials in professional nursing education. Next. So uh, just briefly about me, um, I have, um, I, I'm a nurse leader, I'm a, a nurse educator and a nurse entre entrepreneur, and I've held different leadership positions from the bedside to the CNO, Vice President of Patient Care Services position. Um, I'm currently teaching at Emory University in the graduate level programs. And I am absolutely passionate about developing nurse leaders. I'm also passionate about igniting innovation among healthcare teams. And lastly, I am passionate about leading in service to others. And next, I wanna just turn it over to my colleague and friend, Lucy LeClaire. Hey, thank you everyone. It's so great to be here. And um, I've been a, in nursing for quite a while as well with um, some executive level positions along the way and primarily um, have focused on professional development. And my um, philosophy is, um, I use the Robert Frost quote, um, I'm an awakener, not a teacher. Um, and I seek to reveal the excellence that exists in every nurse. And I do that through our, our leadership research and our um, work around professional development. So on that note, I will hand it over to Susan Campus. Hi everyone, um, my name is Susan Campus and it is a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, I too am a nurse with a, a lot of years of experience. Um, my background is in intensive care and I've worked as a, a nurse manager, a director and an executive director throughout my career. And my passion really is on coaching and mentoring. Um, I. My favorite thing in the world is to discover um, potential in others and then to um, really support them in reaching their, their goals. So um, this leadership model, I think, really reflects all three of our, our passions. They're very connected, um, but it's really all about developing and supporting um, the nurse at the bedside and in leadership roles to get those sustained outcomes that we all um, want within our culture. So thanks for letting us be here. All right, so this is Lucy. I'm gonna go ahead and jump right in. The reason we're here today is to talk about our theory. Um, I don't think the three of us ever imagined we would consider ourselves nurse theorists when we became um, nurses so long ago, but we are um, really excited today to share with you not just the, the theory of human-centered leadership and the evidence and research behind it, but the ways you can practically apply the um, dimensions of a human-centered leader uh, within practice, within practice settings, as well as academia. And that's why ALSN is a perfect venue for us to talk about it. This is the cover of our book that um, aligns with the work we've been doing, not just over the last two to three years, but over the last three or four decades of our lives as we've uh, navigated being nurses from the bedside to the boardroom. And this is the cover of our book that will be available for pre-ordering around May and then um, books available to actually purchase in the fall. And it's called Human-Centered Leadership in Healthcare Evolution of a Revolution. And we're gonna talk more about that later. And we love that the word love is in revolution and yeah, in revolution So um, to, and in evolution actually. So um, we're gonna go through um, the content today that enhances not just the research and evidence, but um, it's, we're gonna move through the content of the book in a way that will give you some insight into human-centered leadership and practical application for your students or for your 
nurses if you're working in practice. So another big exciting part for us, I don't, how many of you are familiar with Jean Watson? And you don't have to, to chime in, you can go in the chat, but we were super um, excited that Dr. Watson um, was gracious to read our book and write the foreword for our book. So I'm just gonna share an excerpt with you today. And um, so Dr. Watson says, you will see in this work, it's all about humanity and all about you and not about you. It is about a higher consciousness that holds and captures the core truths of leadership as a universal living phenomenon of knowing, being, becoming a human-centered leader. So we were excited to um, have her words come to life to share um, our vision for human-centered leadership. So part one, and this is where I think the, a lot of the researchers and evidence-based practice gurus in our group today will, um, will be happy to see that this uh, model theory of leadership is based in evidence and research. And we're gonna start off by framing for you the um, theory itself is based in complexity. And we want um, to recognize that um, human-centered leaders, anyone who's in healthcare, um, signed up to work with people, signed up to work with humans every day for 24 hours a day, 365, um, we deal with people and we, um, we believe that human-centered leaders recognize the humanity in, in ourselves and in each other and, um, and our theory is based in evidence. So this is part one. And we, we also believe um, that nothing is more powerful than a, an idea that's time has come. And although she, and this is from Victor Hugo, but we, we've recognized through our, our decades of service in nursing that, um, that we've, we've seen human-centered leaders throughout the years that we've worked. Those leaders we would follow to the end of the earth. And in the last two years, the last year or so with the pandemic, it's become more evident that we need to refocus on being human-centered in healthcare. And that's why we believe this theory, nursing-specific, contemporary, based in complexity um, is, is, is an idea that is ready for the world. So for, for perspective, and this is where we wanna um, give you a perspective check around why human-centered leadership. And most of you are familiar with traditional leadership. Um, and that's, we've seen it in our workplaces, wherever we might be, if it's academia or practice. And traditional leadership is that has that hierarchy, it's top down, um, the leaders stay above the system generally, and there's linear thinking. And so what does linear thinking mean? Linear means cause and effect. Linear means if, um, in, and we've all seen this, I believe in healthcare is, are the algorithms and the standardization of if we do A and then we do B, we're always gonna get C. Well, how many of you have ever worked with patients? Do they respond the way we think we would like them to respond every time we do A and B? Um, no. And do our teams respond that way when we, you know, A plus B gives us C? Generally, um, it doesn't happen when we're dealing with humans who are embedded in complex systems. So we're going to talk about the alternative to traditional leadership today, which is really human-centered leadership. And then the outcomes in traditional leadership result from the um, leader's authority and influence over the group. In contrast, complexity um, theory and structure are the basis for human-centered leadership. And when we think about complexity um, theory, and um, if you're familiar with complex adaptive systems, that's really a lot of um, um, the foundational work that, that we did when we were going through the research process for um, developing human-centered leadership. And in complexity um, models, the leader is embedded within the system. And the, the thinking is not collateral thinking, it's, it's um, horizontal thinking. It's, it's, um, it's that um, in a, the influencers and innovators are at the point of service. And that's where the ideas and the um, not just the problems, but the solutions 
are determined by those doing the work. And the value is determined by the consumers. And finally, we know in complex systems, this is what I was alluding to about linear thinking versus nonlinear thinking, which is a hallmark of complexity science, is that change and unpredictability are predictable. And we should learn to expect that as leaders. And again, the last year has really taught us that um, we need to expect the unexpected and learn to pivot and um, change our ways of thinking about uh, managing healthcare. So the research part, and um, to me, this is, um, I'm the research nerd in our group, so I, I love this part to talk about, but we believe that um, this quote really captures um, what research it, for human-centered leadership um, has done. Research is to see what everybody else has seen and to think what nobody else has thought. And what we aimed to do was when we embarked on the constructivist grounded theory research that we're going to summarize today is that we wanted to put a name to um, the social and behavioral processes that we knew existed and we had heard from all our a lot of our colleagues in nursing existed through their experiences. So it's putting a name to something that we know exists, but no one's ever named. And that's what we were attempting to do. And we'll share with you how we, we went about that. So background, I've already talked to you about traditional leadership complexity science, but we, we, we really did our due diligence in um, doing an extensive literature search around leadership um, theories in nursing. And what we found were that um, the nursing and healthcare use borrowed theories and approaches. How many of you are familiar with servant leadership? How many of you are familiar with um, transformational leadership, authentic? Um, we talked about traditional, transactional. These are all approaches and theories that are borrowed from the business world or other worlds and disciplines. And so we, we clearly identified that gap in nursing, because that's how you do research, right? You have to identify that there's a reason um, to explore something new and different. And then the final um, concept here that I think um, was really important as we started this work with it, think about practice theories versus leadership theories specific to nursing. How many of you can think of um, practice theories? Uh, Nightingale, um, theory of environment, Leininger, Theory of Culture Care, Orem, Self-Care, Benner, Novice to Expert, and Watson's Caring Theory. Those are just a few. Now, um, consider name a nursing leadership theory. And I know I hear crickets, unless you have something that we weren't able to find, but we were not able to find any, any um, specific nursing leadership theory. So this really provided the gap for us to be able to embark on qualitative constructivist grounded theory, which means there has to be very little um, um, current research or historical research on the actual topic. So show me the evidence. How many of you say that? Um, and you expect your students and you expect your nurses to practice um, evidence-based care, evidence-based practice. We drill it into our, our um, undergraduate students as well as our graduate students in particular, whether they're in a master's or DMP or PhD program. So um, showing you the evidence, and we're gonna talk a lot more in part three, Kay's gonna share with you the details of our, our model and our dimensions, but we embarked on a constructivist grounded theory approach over, and it took about two years for us to go through this process. And um, if you're, if you're familiar with constructive grounded theory, that's awesome. But if you're not, I'll just tell you very quickly that it's an approach that honors the, um, the literature. It honors the history around a, a, a social or behavioral um, concept. And it honors the researcher's experience, um, which in our, our case spans over you know decades and decades of experience, as well as most importantly, all that goes alongside the participants' experiences. So we, um, we had focus groups and we uh, talked to, um, in interviews and focus groups, nurses from the bedside to the boardroom to um, chief nurse executives. And 
what we did is we asked them two very simple questions. We had a whole list of questions ready for our interview process because we thought, how are we going to get people to talk about, about nursing leadership? And so we only ended up having to ask two questions. And the first question was, describe, tell us about a leader in your, that you've known in your past or who you currently work for, who you would follow to the end of the earth. What was it about that nurse leader that, that made you feel that way? And I, I know some of you are probably right now thinking about that nurse leader in your life. And I hope you are because, and I hope it matches up with what we're gonna talk about because we um, really got some um, consistent themes, saturated themes, um, and it, it, it became very clear who, what that leader looked like and that evolved into our human-centered leader. The second question you're wondering, Mike, that we asked was um, describe a leader who made you want to leave a position or a role um, over your career. And I think most of us on, in this um, forum today can also think of that leader who may have caused us um, to want to leave a position. So all that to say, it was very cathartic for the nurses and our worries about them not wanting to talk or share with us were quickly put to rest because it was very cathartic for, for all of the uh, participants to share both, um, both descriptions of end of earth leaders and nurses and not end of earth leaders. So the results were we, um, through advanced coding and um, thematic analysis, we identified 15 common attributes and we were able to place them into three dimensions that were associated with three outcomes and cultures. And we're gonna talk more about that later. Um, so the results, invisible threads are the strongest ties. And we keep using quotes to transition here, but this is so true about theories. Um, if, you've, if you're a fan of theory or if you've studied theory, we all use theory whether we recognize it or not because theories are invisible um, structures that guide us through our, our day, whether it's in nursing practice or nursing academia. So that's um, what we were excited to discover that there are invisible threads in nursing leadership. And big picture results, again, Kay's gonna talk more about each of these um, dimensions when we get to um, part three. So I won't go over these right now, but you can see the primary dimensions are the awakener, connector, and upholder. And there are five attributes and their associated definitions, which um, emerged from our advanced coding um, into this process. And this is the, the model that resulted, the visual representation that illustrates the, the dimensions, um, the associated attributes, the results, the outcomes, because that's what we're really about. We want to know how does how does um, leadership relate to outcomes. And um, again, Kay's going to go through this in detail for you. So implications. And, and I, I apologize if I'm talking kind of fast, but I want to make sure we cover so much information today. So um, please, please um, provide questions to when the, the time comes for us to do that. But Implications for nurse leaders. Um, what's the million dollar question? The million dollar question is, does a, a nurse leader's approach influence patient outcomes? And that's one thing we believe um, the nurse leaders that we would follow to the end of the earth were the nurse leaders who had good, good outcomes. And when I say good outcomes, I mean quality um, nursing sensitive indicators, retention. They were the nurse leaders who kept their staff um, um, on board. So it's, it's those types of um, outcomes and that's what we wanna do. And we wanna test this theory with outcomes in, in practice, whether it's in um, clinical settings or academia. And then um, implication, another implication for nurse leaders, it's an evidence-based leadership approach and theory. And um, because of all the research we've done. And, and one final note before I hand it over um, to Susan is that this research um, that I've just described in a few minutes is published in Journal of Nursing Management um, as of February, 2021. So it's available there. And if you wanna reach out to us with questions about the actual research, we'd be happy 
to um, talk to you about that. But on that note, I am going to hand it over to Susan to talk about part two. So I think the one thing that makes our theory so unique and really so special is the our hashtag is that it starts with you, but it's not about you. And um, what we look at is really the self-care of the leader. Um, next. So in our model, the figure in the center is the leader. And I just want to point out a few things. First and foremost, um, the figure is standing strong and straight. Um, uh, the heart is emphasized, which to me means um, a lot of self-compassion, um, a lot of self-kindness, um, a lot of self-care. Um, the arms are, are extended outward in kind of an embrace, inclusiveness. Um, really, we, we've identified three dimensions, but in reality, our very first dimension is about the self-care of the leader. Um, and that's kind of what I'm gonna briefly talk about now. Next. So it starts with you and um, it starts with you about self-care. And if Lucy said she was the research nerd, I'm the self-care nerd. And um, I think this is one aspect in leadership that we tend to overlook. Um, and it's, it's really, really, really important for success. So, um, the self-care elements that we identified was self-awareness, self-care, self-compassion, and mindfulness. Um, self-awareness is really all about understanding that underlying intention that steers our thoughts and our actions and our behaviors. Um, and when we have a self-awareness, um, we have a greater empathy for others. Our listening skills improve, our critical thinking skills improve. We focus on developing strong, meaningful relationships and our leadership capabilities become enhanced. Um, Self-awareness is really all about asking yourself the question, number one, how well do I know myself? Number two, how do others perceive me? Number three, what are those things that we keep hidden? And four, to me, and to me is a very important four, is what are our blind spots? Um, the self-awareness journey really allows us as leaders to live in a place of integrity and authenticity, and we become much more connected to our daily experiences and our relationships. Self-care is the way we treat ourselves. And any activity that we deliberately do to take care of our physical, mental, and emotional health is self-care. Um, and it's really about establishing intentional daily habits that uh, nurture and support our overall sense of well being. Um, self care is not selfish, it's not self indulgent, and it's not about adding more to do's to an already loaded to do list. It's incorporating it into your habits that you have on a daily basis. Self compassion is how we relate to ourselves. While self-care is about doing for ourselves, self-compassion is about thinking of, of ourselves. And you show your self-compassion when you can view and acknowledge your life struggles with understanding and kindness. You show yourself some grace and some kindness. Um, you give yourself the benefit of the doubt instead of using that nasty negative talk and negative chatter to undermine your intentions. Mindfulness is the, prop, the process of purposefully bringing attention and awareness to the experience that are occurring at the present moment. Um, it's being fully present. It's aware of where we are. It's aware of what we're doing and we're not feeling over judgmental. We're, calling it out for what it is and then letting, letting it go. It doesn't overwhelm us. It doesn't stress us out. It's attempting to stay peaceful and calm during incredible times of stress, fear, or agitation. 
Um, mindfulness is a real important aspect of self-care, self-compassion, and it's directly related to self-awareness. And the past year that we've been through, I think all four of these components have really risen to light, which makes me really, really happy. And this is a big part of what our model is all about is the self-care and self-compassion for the leader. So I'm gonna hand it over to Kay and let her talk about the second part of our hashtag, which is, but it's not about you. Thanks, Susan. So part three is titled, It's Not About You. And in this section, our intention is to um, focus on how the leader goes about emanating their energy outward to lead others. So we talk about the awakener, which is that dimension of leadership that focuses on developing a culture of excellence. And the connector is the dimension of the leader that works on creating a culture of trust. And then lastly, we have the upholder who is focused on creating a culture of caring. Next. So it starts with you, but it's not about you. So the goal of the human-centered leader is to awaken that, like, like Lucy said earlier, awaken that excellence that exists within those team members. And the goal of the human-centered leader is also to connect the team members. We talk about connecting and uniting the team around mission, vision, values, and goals. And then lastly, the goal of the human-centered leader is to uphold the team members. And by this, we mean care for them, recognize the humanity in each one, just like we've recognized the humanity in ourself, like what Susan was talking about earlier with the self-practices. Next. <laughs> So I want to start by talking with you about the impact of the dimension called the awakener. So the awakener is that part of leadership that focuses on cultivating the people, developing, growing the individual team members. And it's through this process that the leader achieves a professionally prepared workforce and those patient outcomes that we're looking for. So this is a culture of excellence. And it's that culture of excellence that gives us sustained outcomes around quality patient care and patient safety. So that is the portion of our model that deals with the impact of the dimension of the awakener. Next, Please. Okay, next, I want to talk with you about the um, leadership attributes of the awakener. So the awakener uh, demonstrates these different attributes. The first one is the motivator. And as a motivator, the awakener is connecting with that intrinsic motivation that uh, helps connect people to their why and to their purpose. Um, the awakener is also a coach. And by this, I mean, they are helping people to grow where they're planted, to just do their best in the job that they're in and feel good about what they're doing. Then as a mentor, the awakener takes more of a long-term view. They're looking across the whole uh, idea of a professional career and they're guiding the individuals. Next, the awakener is an architect. And by this, I mean that they're ensuring that the structure is in place for those team members to come together to innovate and create uh, the answers and solutions to the problems that they're experiencing at the point of care. And lastly, the awakener is an advocate, making certain that the team members have the resources they need to be able to deliver excellent care. Next. Okay, so let's talk about the impact of the connector. 
So the connector is that dimension of a leader that focuses in on building the community. We like to say the connector builds unity in the community. And by that, I mean they are bringing together the team around the common goals, around the common mission and vision. And when that is accomplished, what you achieve, we can call a healthy work environment. And we all know what a healthy work environment looks like. Either we've worked in one or we've dreamed of one. But that healthy work environment is the representation of a culture of trust. And when you have a culture of trust, you have engaged employees. And also you have nurse retention, which is super important in today's times. Next. So the leader who's acting as a connector demonstrates the, these attributes of the connector. And the first one is collaborator. And I love the idea of a collaborator because as a leader, you're inviting people to come together with their individual and different perspectives, but through a process of collaborating to come out with answers and ideas and create creations that are so much more than one person could have done on their own. Um, also, the connector is a supporter. By this, I mean they stand behind and they stand by their team. They're also an edge walker. And the term edge walker is one we have just grown to love because what an edge walker is, is a leader who walks the edge between the way things have always been done and the unpredictability of the complex system of healthcare. So the edge walker is embracing unpredictability and looking for that innovation that's right around the corner whenever you're in the midst of chaos, as we all know. Um, the connector is also an engineer. And what that means is the connector sees those strengths in each individual and plugs them in to the right place so that they, their strengths will benefit the team and those individuals will shine. Um, lastly, the connector is an authentic communicator, which just means they walk their talk. And we know that that is the sort of leader that brings about a culture of trust. Next. So lastly, I wanna tell you about the impact of the upholder. So the upholder is focusing on caring for the team members. And as an upholder, they recognize we're all human. They recognize the humanity in each one, just like they've recognized the humanity in themselves. And through this, they're able to achieve an experience that is good for everybody. It's a place where nurses and uh, nursing teams want to work and a place where patients want to get their care. So we, we create through this process um, a culture of caring and that's where we get those sustained outcomes of improved patient experience and uh, improved nurse and nursing team satisfaction. Next. So here are the attributes that the leader embraces as they are reflecting the dimension of the upholder. So first of all, personal well-being and mindfulness. And with this, I just want you to think about the fact that a leader who personally accepts and works towards their own well-being and is uh, mindful as well that leader demonstrates and models these self practices, you could call them, to their team. And by modeling that to their team, it has a huge impact on the way that their team responds and takes care of their self. Um, the upholder is also others oriented. And by that, I mean, they're humble. They enjoy the fact that in their leadership, leading means serving. The upholder is also very high in emotional intelligence. They are emotionally aware. 
They understand their own emotions as well as others, and they are social and organizationally aware. Next. So now I'm gonna turn it back over to Lucy, who's gonna take it up with part number four. All right, so thanks, Kay. And, um, and this to me is one of the, it's the nuts and bolts part. It's how to, so we've, we've talked about this great theory, this, the research and what each of the dimensions from the, the leader to the, at the outward focus. So what do we do with all that? And in part four, developing the people who lead the people, we dedicated six chapters in our book to, um, to practical application of this, um, of this theory. And again, these can be used in academia or in practice. So um, we're not gonna go through everything in these six chapters. We're gonna highlight um, what each of them covers and why it's important. And um, that leads us to actually our, our mission as a research team and as a leadership development team. Um, this is our mission statement. Um, and I think it summarizes everything we believe about, about leadership in healthcare and in nursing specifically is that our mission is to develop the people who lead the people who care for the people. And um, we'll go into to how that development occurs. So emotional intelligence, Kay mentioned this and um, Susan alluded to it as well. And, you know, when we talk about emotional intelligence, there are, there are some really key concepts. We talk about conscious, consciousness of self, which is, it starts with you, emotional intelligence, knowing how, um, how your behaviors influence those around you. We talk about consciousness of others, it's not about you. Again, it's the influence that our behaviors have on, on our team members as well as our patients because how we treat our team members and, and how they respond to us is how they will tend to respond to their patients as well. And then finally, consciousness of, of context is included in emotional intelligence. And this is what Kay was talking about. It's that the cultures of excellence, trust, and caring that are developed when we really strengthen our emotional intelligence. And I would point out here that Dr. Watson, Jean Watson's forward mentions consciousness. So she, she is um, also, um, you know, alludes to that concept of us being conscious of our behaviors and how they influence others. Change management. This is expect the unexpected. We talk, um, a lot about linear change management with, I'm, I'm sure every one of you is familiar with linear change management. The nursing process itself is linear change management. Cotter, um, Lewin, we can go on with, with um, these change management theories, but we focus on appreciative inquiry as um, a, you know, a really strong change management technique for human-centered leaders, because if you're familiar with appreciative inquiry, and if you're not, we do talk a lot about this. Um, in this chapter on change management is, um, you know, you, you harness the, the things that have worked. Instead of always focusing on problems, let's focus on um, what we've done well and how we can maximize and, and harness that positive energy. Um, innovation competency. This is the power of thinking differently. And um, an innovation competency is, an, is, is, is what we need in today's world. We've seen it over the last year and and we believe as human-centered leaders, we need to be more structured about innovation competency and how to infuse that into um, the work of our teams and allow the innovation to rise from the point of service. Um, capability versus competency. And this is, a, this is a great concept to think about. We're all familiar again with competency, but what if we started thinking differently um, and went beyond competency and talked about the capability of each leader. Of, and when we say leader, we mean those at the point of service, the nurses at the bedside. So we want to move beyond competency to capability. And then dealing with disruption, all this, this talk about human-centered leadership is fabulous and wonderful, but what do you do when you're surrounded or um, you're surrounded with people who are not human-centered leaders? It's the reality of our world. We, we talked about um, trans, um, sorry, transactional and um, traditional leaders. So we call this chapter actually joy interrupters. What do we, what do you do when um, you're a human-centered leader and someone's um, 
interrupting your joy. You just want to go to work and have a joyful day. So we talk about some ways to handle that. Um, and then I'm going to hand it over to Susan to talk about reflective practice, because this, again, it, it's, it starts with you, but it's not about you. So reflective practice influences um, every part of our team, including ourselves. So I'm going to hand this over to Susan. So I um, have the honor of introducing you to our journal. We also um, put together, and this we, we did this from a place of trying to put together a tool to help nurses from the bedside to the boardroom really um, focus on that self-awareness aspect of self-care, that mindfulness aspect of self-care, and even that self-compassionate and self aspect of self-care. Um, this is a journal that uh, it, it really, it was born out of a lot of love. Um, so reflective journaling um, is a process that we use to help provide clarity to our thoughts and our behaviors and our feelings related to the experiences and concerns and issues that we have on a daily basis. Um, journaling is seen as a powerful tool to help manage the self and to help manage well-being. Um, however, what we, we feel is the practice of reflective journaling can really be improved when there's um, a framework to guide that reflective thought process. So um, SHIFTS is the name of the journal and it's designed by nurses for nurses. And as the title implies, the practice of reflective thinking and reflective journaling will sometimes cause a shift in the way we perceive experiences and events that occur in our life. It's also very obvious that it re is referring to a nursing shift. Um, we, we really tried to use our nurse lingo here. Um, but through reflective practice, we're provided an opportunity to, to pause, to be still, um, and to potentially shift our perspective, to shift our attitude, to shift our behavior, creating that positive shift in our own personal and professional growth. Um, next slide. So this is, this is the inside of our, our journal. Um, the journal uses an S-bar format for uh, for journaling. And, it, and as you all know, an SBAR format is a standardized communication tool that we use in healthcare. Um, but this particular uh, format really steers you to the journalist to thinking about their self care practices, their health, and their well being. Um, the journaling process starts with asking you to identify and commit to an intention. That will be your intention for a period of time, 30 days, 60 days, whatever. Um, but the, the intention um, that, that's chosen will help manifest, manifest the personal and professional goals and vision that you have for yourself. And we've just listed a couple of ideas for uh, intentions. The power of intention helps keep you focused. Um, so we ask you to kind of write it down and commit to it. Um, next. So this is the actual jour journal format. Um, we, you start each moment in journaling with committing to your intention. Um, and the SBAR format is listed here. You start with a situation and this is where you re reflect on an experience or event big or small, positive or negative, that impacted your day. And you just describe what happened. You might ask yourself questions like, what happened? When did it happen? Where did it happen? Were other people involved? Um, those basic questions of, of that experience. Um, the background is where you're encouraged to focus on pertinent information relating to how that experience or situation was influenced by your sense of well being. This is a, to me, this is a real big part because um, you'll focus on your mental, physical, spiritual, and emotional health, um, asking things like, 
did I eat today? Did I get a good night's sleep? Am I drinking enough fluids? Um, am I tired? Um, you just take time out to really reflect on your own um, physical, emotional, spiritual, and mental well being. And the assessment is that's when you're used to encourage your thoughts and insights and analyze your experience. You ask yourself questions of what's really going on. You know, did I, did I lose my temper or was I short with someone because I'm just really tired or I was hangry, I hadn't eaten, I'm not drinking. Um, but, you, but it's an honest, it's transparent. You're, you're talking to yourself. You're asking yourself, what am I learning about myself? Um, how does what I'm learning about myself align with the intention that I've committed myself to? Um, it's about answering these questions in a really authentic and honest way. And then the recommendation challenges that reflection on developing a plan of action to address whatever has been identified. Um, it's used to come up with uh, an action plan that can be used for a foundation of growth and development. And asking yourself questions like, what would I do differently if this situation ever arose again? Where did I shine? You know, acknowledge the shining moments. Um, and, uh, you know, cause there are moments that are not all bad that you, there's times when you come and you're like, I, I rocked it today. And what did I do that that encouraged that and, and made me feel good about that. So um, we're really, really, really excited about this journal and um, being able to provide it as a tool for the frontline staff on up. Um, next. Hey, I think we can have about 10 minutes left for questions. And I think that uh, Kay answered the question about um, the information about where you can get the journal. I'm sorry, is this a good, not, I just kind of like jumped in. Now I see you've got another. No, that that's fine. This is Lucy. We just wanted to, um, okay. I will be very, very quick. I know we've gone long, but the, the last part is just our call with any um, good movement. There's a call to action and we, we mm -hmm. want to invite everyone to, to become a human centered leadership, be part of the research. Um, and recognize it in yourself and others. And then very, very quickly, really wanted to share with you, we, we've done crosswalks um, as well. And we've done a crosswalk of human-centered leadership attributes and dimensions with the AACN draft of the um, Domain 10 um, Essentials. And we know this is a draft, but we think it aligns very, very well with Domain 10, which talks about personal, professional, and leadership development. So we have that, and then we've also crosswalked with the magnet standards, um, healthy work environment, and to the um, we believe in ethical leadership as well. So we've done a crosswalk with um, the ANA code of ethics, and that's everything. <laughs> There's the article. Thank you for being patient with with that last part. Oh, wow. Okay. So a couple of questions from the beginning, and I don't probably have uh, maybe not the opportunity to answer them as thoroughly as you, you might like, but how the human-centered leadership differs from transformational leadership. I can take that. Okay. Um, so it includes the concept of transformational leadership, just like it includes the concept of servant leadership, the concept of emotional intelligence and authenticity. All of these things are kind of wrapped up together in the theory of human-centered leadership. And the idea is that any one of those by itself seemed incomplete to us. Mm -hmm. And by putting all of these together and um, a visual model that people could use as a lens to uh, their own leadership uh, is what our goal was. And I would add to that, this is Lucy, that um, transformational leadership, we recognize it, it's one of the tried and true um, leadership approaches that's been used in healthcare, but it, it's not the essence of nursing necessarily. And that's why we, we believe that human-centered leadership is really um, founded 
in um, from a nursing healthcare perspective, whereas transformational leadership is was really founded within the business world. And we've used it quite well because healthcare is a business, but um, wanted to also point that that nuance out. Yes, it's like we bought the one size fits all skirt at the flea market. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I, maybe I'm the only one that's ever done that though. No, I just that. Um, the, another one was the collateral thinking and how it differs from the integrative or systems thinking. Do you want to go ahead, Kay? Unless you do. No, you, you can go right ahead. I'm thinking. I, I think <laughs> the, the main thing with collaborative thinking in our model is to recognize the complexity of the healthcare system and recognize all the connections throughout the organization and to embrace those connections as a way that innovation and creativity take place and problem solving. And so it, it just really highlights the value of that collaborative thinking more so than a top-down type of uh, leadership style. Thank you. And someone had mentioned uh, nursing. When you, you had asked um, Lucy, I think about a nursing theory, uh, the nursing care and complexity science by Davidson, Ray mm -hmm. and Turkle. So mm -hmm. that was. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. We'll be looking um, that up. <laughs> yes, we will. And and we've been working. Actually, that's a, a good point. Um, and I'll have to look at the chat in a moment to, to see that. But we're, we're working with um, some researchers who have worked with caring science and, doc and um, one of the primary um, data scientists who helped validate um, Dr. Jean Watson's caring, her caritas. And, and, the the and the components of that theory. Mm -hmm. So we are working with him um, and we know that there's a lot of caring science um, theories that are out there that are being tested and validated. So we, we are, um, yeah, it, it fits within the, the world of what we're talking about, definitely. It, it, it's caring. Um, um, yes, because actually but, at, at yeah. UNC and, um, um, the School of Nursing, Kristen Swanson and uh, Chris, yes, Kristen Swanson and Mary Tanjay have done, you know, Carolina Care, which is a whole. Um, but I think when you're talking about making those crosswalks to age caps and to magnet, that really brings mm -hmm. it into the application and away from the from the theory that's up there for most uh, clinical um, nurses. And um, the, probably the last question is that someone had asked about the emotional intelligence and that the self-care does not seem to include the spiritual component. Or was that just kind of embedded in something else? Well, it, I, I can answer that. I think it, it's embedded in the whole self-compassion, self-care, mindfulness. Um, I think it is very much a part of self-care overall self-care is physical mental emotional and spiritual absolutely i'm going to jump in and say thank you so much i want to uh, this is amazing and i like many of the people that i saw in the chat i'm going to start using this in my course with nursing leadership next year take out that people-centered leadership i can't wait to use this wonderful thank you so much i'm going to share my screen and just give no. you a few more updates. let me stop there you go um, okay, um, as uh, was put into the chat, please know that there is CEUs for this uh, presentation today, one uh, contact hour, and also uh, you will need to complete the survey uh, in order to be able uh, to get your contact hour. And then, um, okay, I'm going to see if I can get my little screen to move. Let's see, come on, move, move. Uh -huh. Okay, here we go. I, I would be remiss if I don't take this moment to get, bring to your attention that our annual meeting is coming up in the fall, October 18th. We're going to be out the, uh, in North Carolina um, at the university there. Um, 
Friday uh, Center. Uh, and our, our conference is on leadership science, uh, nursing science rather for leadership in a new decade. Um, we have two wonderful pre-conferences that we're trying this year for the first time. Uh, one three-day, uh, three-hour workshop will with, be with Dr. Leslie Nickel. Uh, she is the um, uh, editor-in-chief for computers, information, informatics, and nursing. And she um, is, um, you know, she leads the editor's workshop every year for all the international and national editors. Um, and uh, she will be facilitating that three-hour workshop. And then we're going to have Dr. Lynn Gallagher Ford, who will lead uh, a three-hour workshop on evidence-based practice. It will be something new for us, and I think you will not want to miss. Um, again, next month, we will have another wonderful webinar. Uh, this webinar is coming to you from uh, Massachusetts, where the Organization for Nurse Leaders teamed up with the Black Nurses Association and created a pledge, a nurse's pledge, for equity, diversity, justice, um, and uh, equality. So um, we stay tuned for that. And then uh, we will have um, our June webinar. We'll have four leading editors uh, from Jonah, um, from the Nursing Administration Quarterly, Nurse Leader, and uh, also Nursing Economics. This particular conference is free. I, I know you'll want to join us uh, for and get your students to join us. Uh, this is about how to get your work published. And then again, we will have our own president of the ALSN, uh, Dr. Uh, David, ba David Bailey, um, who is um, the chief nurse exec in California. And David will talk to us about his, his own uh, um, you know, studies on leadership, on authentic leadership, and will be joined by uh, Dr. Joyce uh, Fitzpatrick and Dr. Roseanne Rosso. And then in um, September, uh, we will have uh, one of our other members of the association, Dr. Holly We, who will talk to us about the from the edge of chaos to growth and strategies to adapt beyond the pandemic. So, with that, I want to thank you again, everyone, for coming today, for our excellent speakers, and we hope to see you again next month. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.